and welcome. And on behalf of Teamwork Arts and the British Library, we welcome you to the 2021 edition of JLF London at the British Library. We're so excited to present to you today the essential Elif Shafak and Tamima Anam. Elif Shafak and Tamima Anam in conversation with B. Rolat. The session's presented in partnership with tourism partner Rajasthan Tourism. <coughs> Navigating through their writing journey and experiences, two extraordinary authors give us a glimpse into their inspirations and process. Booker Prize shortlisted author Elif Shafak explores the dichotomy and, nu and nuances she brings alive with her words. Celebrated author Tamima Anam deftly weaves the personal and the political. They speak to Bo B. Rolat about their enthralling books, their origins and the powerful symbolism behind each character they brought to life. Elie Shafak is an award-winning British-Turkish novelist. She's published 19 books, 12 of which are novels. She's a global bestseller, and her work has been translated into 55 languages. Her latest novel, 10 minutes 38 seconds, In This Strange World, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize and RSL Onjati Prize, and was Blackwell's Book of the Year. Tamima Anam, Commonwealth Writers Prize, an O. Henry Prize, and has been named one of Granta's best young British novelists. She's a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times and was recently elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. B. Rolat works in the British Library's cultural events team. Her award-winning travelogue, In Search of Mary, was a biography of the year. She co-wrote the bestseller, Talking About Jane Austen in Baghdad. Please do feel free to ask questions, which B will direct, and we have microphones. Ladies and gentlemen, the, ess the essential Elif Shafak and Tamima Anam. Thank you so much for being here. And it's in real life, which is so exciting. I can't quite cope with this three-dimensional experience. Um, you've been to Jaipur in a digital format before, but not in real. Is that right? Tamimi, you have been to real Jaipur. OK, this is as close as we can get right now. And have you been to the British Library before? Wonderful. And of course you have. So it's the two of the greatest things that you can do happening at the same time, which is quite wonderful. I'm very excited. Um, Elif, I immersed myself, I re-immersed myself in your books over my summer holiday. And on top of this sort of very delicious escapism that we all look to in your novels, I sensed in your most recent one here, The Island of Missing Trees, um, an almost urgent sense of the present world. What you've done is look at um, deep, a deeply divided society, a, a fractured society, and also look in a very curious way at the, at the benign influence of nature, at the healing power of nature and how it can almost bear witness. Um, and it felt as though you were, you were engaging and witnessing the very things that we're living without without saying as much. Did I overread it? No, it's beautiful. I mean, I, I really appreciate your words and it's wonderful to, to share the stage, the three of us. Um, I think I've been wanting to write about Cyprus for a very long time. That's the truth. And there's no doubt this is a beautiful island with beautiful people, north and south. And it's also interesting that even though it, the, the history of Cyprus is all part of the history of this very country, and even though it's one of the top destinations for British tourists, not many people know that much about the complexity of the, the history in Cyprus. So that was also interesting to me. But basically, the reason why I found it difficult and why I couldn't do it for so long is because even though this is a beautiful place, it's also a place where the past is still alive. It is not a bygone affair. You know, The, the past is not sealed and left behind. I think it's still breathing within this very moment. There are wounds in Cyprus, and those wounds are unhealed. There's accumulated grief and, and clashing memories, depending on whom you talk to. How do you tell the story of a place that has been 
ravaged by or that has experienced ethnic violence, partition, division, without yourself falling into the trap of nationalism as a storyteller, without yourself falling into the trap of tribalism. Only when I found the fig tree and the voice of the fig tree, that gave me another angle, maybe a bit more courage to approach the story. Only then I could dare to write. And it is very courageous. So we, we, we are the... We, we, we experience the fig tree in the first person. Um, tell us more about how you found that voice, the voice of the tree. The tree yeah. falls in love. Yeah, this is actually, uh, first of all, it's a female tree. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, fig trees are fascinating. They, it's, they're remarkable and they sustain an entire ecosystem. So when you kill a fig tree, actually, it's an entire habitat you're destroying. And also it's somebody's memories you are destroying. This is also an immigrant tree. One of the many fascinating things about the trees is if you take a cutting, um, well, this is a bit illegal, but you know, if you smuggle that cutting into the European continent in your suitcase and then immediate, immediately plant the tree, if the weather permits, that, that cutting is going to grow into a new tree, but it will, it will also carry the old tree in its DNA and in its soul. But if I may add this very quickly, I lived in the States for a few years. I, I used to teach there. And I've never forgotten in Michigan, Ann Arbor, it was so cold. I met these immigrant families who would bury their fig trees when the winters were too harsh. I confess I had to Google this. It really is a thing. <laughs> it is a botanical technique to help the trees survive. So basically this vertical tree, you prune, you dig a trench in the ground, you pu push it down, it becomes a horizontal tree with only a few roots dangling because all the other roots are cut off. And then uh, you cover it and come next spring, you unearth the tree and it becomes vertical again. And this metaphor of burying and unburying secrets of the past is a strong theme throughout the book. Did you want to speak to the deeper divisions that have emerged in societies, not just here, but, but further afield? Has that been a, a lingering preoccupation of yours? Absolutely. I mean, we talk about Cyprus, we talk about the UK, and of course, so many subjects that we deal with, Tahmima and I, you know, with regards to memory, identity, belonging, displacement, the stories that we bring with us, but also the silences that run deep in our families, intergenerational memory, how the first generation, perhaps the ones that have suffered the most, they don't have a language to talk about those experiences. And the second generation does not want to talk about the past because they have to find their feet, they have to build a new life. It is the third or the fourth generations in many immigrant families or families from complex backgrounds who are asking the biggest questions about identity, belonging. So you can come across young people who are carrying the memories of their elderly. I find that fascinating. Well, that brings us very neatly to you, Tamima, who, um, Tamima, Tamima Anam, whose new book, The Startup Wife, will be coming to shortly. But Tamima, your renowned Bengal trilogy comprises three astonishing works, A Golden Age, The Good Muslim, and The Bones of Grace. And they chart three successive generations of a family and also the birth of the nation of Bangladesh and, and, and the violence that, that gave birth to Bangladesh. Can you talk about that inheritance? Sure. Um, thank you all so much for being here, by the way. And it's such an honor to be here with Elif and B. Um, so I was uh, come from a generation of children who were born after the Bangladesh War. And for me and for, my, for the generation that I belong to, um, the stories of the war are sort of like the main family inheritance that we sort of um, are gain. Um, my parents, I grew up outside of Bangladesh and my parents repeatedly told stories about the war and it, was, it wasn't always stories about war, but it was about what it was like to belong to a generation of people who dreamed a country into being. And every decision that they made in their lives seemed to go back to that moment. So whether it was their social and political commitment, whether it was decisions about their career or the way that they were raising their children, it was all back to that moment. Or even the way that they would admonish me, you know, well, I wasn't born in an independent country. You were born in an independent country. You have certain responsibilities that come along with your rights. So when I sat down to write, um, it really was the only thing on my mind because it felt so present to me. And it was also a way, and I think we, you know, we sort of lay claim to moments in history by writing them. 
even when they don't belong to us or they feel slightly elusive. So having been born after the war, I didn't live through that moment. I was myself kind of nomadic. So writing those books was a way of belonging to a place that I sort of had a kind of longing for but didn't quite wasn't quite able to own until I wrote those books. That was you planting your fig tree. That's right. Setting yeah. those memories um, to flourish. But then you kind of did a, a, a handbrake turn and went somewhere completely else with the startup wife. And people did not expect the book that you wrote. What got into you? Um, <laughs> uh, I ask myself that sometimes too. And we talked about this a lot. So. Um, I was on the board of a startup company that was founded by my husband for 10 years. And I attended a lot of board meetings and investment pitches. And I um, sort of got to participate as a fly on the wall in this world that was totally alien to me. Because previous to that, I had been an academic and then I had been a writer. And a lot, I mean, I've, so the, the real truth is a lot of really sexist things happened to me and in front of me. Um, and living in a slightly bubbled world of academia or as a writer, I had never really been in the working world. I had never known what it was like to sit in a room full of men who were making decisions or trying to schedule a meeting or trying to make decisions out in the world. And it was so fascinating to me the way in which patriarchy can kind of manifest itself in those very micro moments. And, and this book was basically an elaborate revenge fantasy. <laughs> so I thought, anytime something happened to me, I thought, I'm gonna write that down. You're gonna regret saying that to me. So, and then of course I, um, so I wrote this novel. And and then I, I, as soon as I written it, I deeply regretted it because I thought this is gonna be terrible for my career. No one will ever take me seriously again. There are too many jokes. There are too many references to sex. It's just gonna be terrible. Um, and I still haven't really decided whether it was a good idea or not, but, I'm, but it was really fun having the, be, being able to sort of um, embody that sort of fantasy that I had about, you know, writing about this corporate world that I had suddenly, you know, had a uh, so it's been, the table at. So it's been hailed as a trenchant portrait of high-tech America's frat boy misogyny. But, and you, and you skewer that amazing, and it's so funny. But there's also, you know, you, you're also vulnerable, and you, and you know, the, the, well, I should say the character of Asher, because that's a, 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 a mistake I shouldn't have made. But the character of Asher is really opens herself to, to vulnerability as, a, as an immigrant, as a woman of color, in operating in that world. So this is the woman who has coded a new social media platform to rival, and I quote, Jesus Christ and Mark Zuckerberg. The thing just starts to go completely crazy. But there's an extraordinary moment um, that I've picked upon just before it, the, the whole system takes off, before it goes really, really crazy, where um, there, she and some, Asher and some friends are with, there's a couple of them, at a Girls Who Boss networking night. And I, I loved this scene um, because they're talking about, you know, being boss bitch, being a badass, and yet the things that hold you back and, and, and what is the thing that, that you know, how, how complicit can you be? Um, as, as Asha says, who wants to be the uptight girl who makes everyone shush the minute she walks into the room? We feel like we have to bro it up with the other guys. We want to be on the inside, we want to hang. We want to win. So she has to tread that compromise. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so uh, sometimes when I speak to rooms full of female founders or women in technology and they say, what can we do about bro culture? And obviously I don't have the answer to that because I'm just a very, very small part of this very big world. But I have, you know, one of the things that I sometimes suggest is a lot of things happen and then we just kind of laugh them off. You know those moments of sexism that you witness and you don't wanna be the person who's like, that was really rude or why did you say that? And we don't call things out because it's awkward. And, and, and even making it normal or normalizing calling things out for what they are or saying, I know you didn't mean that when you just asked me where my kids were for the 10th time in the day as if I had like left them on the street because I came to do my job. Um, so I think that's Asha's dilemma. Does she want to be um, the outspoken, powerful woman that she knows she can be, or does she want to win? Does she want to participate in the game enough so that people don't really notice that she's a woman and they kind of let her win just, you know, because she sort of got away with it? Critically, though, she has her, her network of female friends, and that's very much a theme in your work, too. 
the sisterhood. Um, I'm thinking of Leila Tequila and the five friends. How important is that to you in your life as a writer? It's a beautiful question. I, I think it's very important to me. Also, it goes all the way back to my childhood because of the way I was, I was brought up. I, I was born in France, in, in Strasbourg, and I remember that first house that I was brought into as full of immigrants, leftist students, a lot of tobacco smoke in the air. You know, it's a very matriarchal upbringing. Not that one. That one was a little bit more, you know, dreaming of a revolution, <laughs> reading Jean Paul Sartre, but not so much Simone de Beauvoir. Mm -hmm. But my parents afterwards got separated, so my father stayed in France, and my mother brought me to Turkey, because for her it was motherland. For me, it was a completely new country. And from that environment, we, we came to Ankara, to my grandmother's house, which was a very conservative, very inward-looking, very patriarchal world. And from then after, th uh, that moment onwards, I was raised by these two women, my mother and my grandmother, who were completely different personalities. But the reason why I'm mentioning this is because they supported each other. So I know firsthand that when women support each other, especially through the bumpy periods, rough times in your lives, which we had at the time, uh, if women can empower each other at those crossroads, the impact of that kind of sisterhood or solidarity goes beyond generations. Because it changed my mother's life, it changed also my life, the fact that my grandmother supported her at a difficult moment. So I am a big believer in, in sisterhood, and I think this is a crucial moment in time when we need international solidarity, when we need international sisterhood, actually more than ever before. And if I may quickly add this, there was this perception in the world that the Western world was safe and solid, and you didn't have to worry about the future of democracy or the future of women's rights. Uh, I, I, I have heard people telling me that it was very understandable for me to be a feminist. After all, I was living in Turkey, as if, if you're living in the States, you don't have to be a feminist. All of that is shattered to pieces. And now we know time, or now we know better that time can go backwards. And when countries go backwards, the first thing will, that will be taken away will be women's rights and minority rights. So we have to be more passionate in defending each other's rights and also defending democracy. And that brings me to something I wanted to, to raise with you. Um, Chekhov says that the, the novelist's job is to describe the problem. But both of you step up to the patriarchy and grab it by the neck. And I feel that you extend that mission, that you're doing more than just describing the problem. Tamima, do you? Oh, well, so I Do you hope that to change I people's minds? I think... I believe that I was put on this earth to um, have uh, to be an activist, but I just do it through writing. Um, now I don't always do it in, on every page of every novel because that would make it really dull. And obviously, I'm interested in telling stories, and that is my primary aim when I'm writing a novel. But I really vehemently disagree with the idea that writing is somehow ever apolitical. I think it's always polit political. I think we're always saying things. I think we are getting into people's heads, and that is a huge responsibility. So I feel, um, you know, that it that it. That there's, I have a sacred duty <laughs> to to you know change the things that I feel are unjust in the world, um, and I am no longer sort of apologetic about that and saying, well, you know, I really try to be an artist too. I think that is the whole point of art, and I you know I think for me at least it's important to embrace that. Elif, what's your sacred duty? No, just yeah, in, very much in agreement with everything Tahmima said. Also, I think if you happen to be a storyteller coming from wounded democracies, you really don't have the luxury of saying, I don't want to talk about politics, I only want to talk about my own writing. If so much is happening outside the window, you have to speak about it. I also believe one of the many wonderful things we have learned from past feminist generations, generations of feminist movement, is that politics is not only about what Boris Johnson said today or what political parties meant or how they clash, it's beyond that, it's more than that. Wherever there is power, there is politics. So you might be writing about sexuality, you might be writing about gender, marriage, heartbreak. You can be very political while writing about these issues as well. So in that regard, we can't be apolitical. And I think this, this is a moment for us to be more engaged as writers. However, I make a distinction between asking questions and trying to dictate the answers. 
I don't like it when writers maybe, you know, try to dictate the answers for every reader because I feel like uh, that's something else. But I believe my job as a writer is to ask questions, diffi including difficult questions about difficult issues. And like Tahmima said, you know, open up a space where a diversity of opinions can be heard. And then you leave the answers to the reader because each reader is going to come up with their own interpretation. I know couples who have been married to each other for 45 years, you know, they read the same book. One of them loves it, the other one not so much. Friends who share everything, one of them loves the book, the other one not so much. Why? Because we bring our own gaze as readers, we're not passive. So leave the answers to the reader, but I think a writer should be asking the difficult questions. And another theme that, that's emerged, um, and these two books, I feel, sit very comfortably together. This is, um, it's effectively a pamphlet, it's a non-fiction piece of work that you've done, and it does sit very well with Island of Missing Trees, how to stay sane in an age of division. So it's about, again, the, the fracturing, the, the deep divisions that have emerged recently and all you know, amplified by social media. And one of the things that you, you emphatically address in this is the power of listening. And I've noticed online there's a real tendency to people, there's almost in a sort of hashtag way of people going, I feel seen or you know, somebody sees me. But being heard... And having, and having someone listen to you is, is surely even more powerful. I think you quote Audre Lorde about um, the, the, you know, the channeling of our anger and the, the power of listening. Um, as a writer, how, how does that manifest? How does that work? Where do you listen? I think we, as writers, we have to be good readers all our lives, but also we have to be good listeners, just to listen to what people are saying, but also how they're saying what they're saying, with what kind of energy choice of words, emotions. So observe, listen, absorb, <clears throat> and respect. Um, that to me is important, that perhaps being a bit of an intellectual nomad. But if I may add quickly, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were some signs in public parks across London. Um, and the question was, when all this is over, what would you like to see you know, changing? What kind of a world would you like to live in? And people had scribbled, they had written their own answers, anonymous. Uh, and somebody had written, when all this is over, I want to live in a world where I can be heard. And that to me is very important because let's go back to early 2000s, late 1990s, there was so much optimism in the world. And we were promised that thanks to digital technologies, everyone was going to have a voice. And fast forward today, so many of us feel voiceless. I feel like there's a scream building up inside us. There's so much anxiety, so much anger. So listening is a very important part, but also it has to go hand in hand with speaking up. Tamima, how do you listen as a writer? So I have a slightly um, tangential anecdote. I was, um, I have, one of my aunts is deeply religious, so she wears a head to toe hijab. And I was in her house one day and she took out this little stick from inside her burqa. And it was a thing that she used to clean her teeth. It's called a miswak, right? And then I was like, oh, where did that come from? And she said, well, I have pockets sewn into my hijab. So I have one for my phone, and then I have one for my miswak. And then she looked at me and she said, you're going to write that down. <laughs> and uh, I think so. I think it's just uh, have the privilege of having somewhere to put everything. So whatever happens to me, good or bad, or observations, or things that um, you know move me, I, I always have somewhere to put it. I, I know that I'm going to file an experience. So I'm kind of living my life, but I'm also like filing things away for later. And I think that's an enormous privilege. Um, and it allows me to be able to listen and to hear and to bear witness to, you know, whether it's a, an aunt or, or the world. Um, so that's that's just a small little example of what that means in my life. I just want to flag up that we will have questions, probably in about 15 minutes. Um, but if you're watching online and you're joining us in India or anywhere else around the world, please do add your questions in and uh, we'll get to them at a later point. Um, if you've got any now, stick your hand up because we weren't able in the last session to get round everybody. So I felt a bit guilty about that. There's a keen person already with a question. Do you want to shout it out and I'll relay it to the audience? I, uh, maybe, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but I was brought up in South Africa under apartheid uh, many years ago, as you were this one seeing me. Uh, <clears throat> and um, it, it created in me 
absolute hatred of authority and a hatred of the patriarchy. And this is reinforced by difficulties between myself and my family for what we caused a lot of the difficulties. I just want to say how refreshing it is and how emotional it makes me feel. Seeing three people who A are female and B are of colour. Because in South Africa, for instance, you were not allowed to pour alcohol in front of women because it was corrupting. Oh, that's a, that's a very kind. That's a very kind comment. Thank you. So that's really nice to put some bit of appreciation for for our wonderful panel from someone who grew up under apartheid. And you know, as you say, there's it's, 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 there's no we can't bank any any longer on an onwards eternal progression of, of human perfectibility. We are witnessing right now that this is not the case. Um, in fact, the last the last session just before this one was was just an astonishing glimpse into that chasm. So I'm for one very grateful for work that that does attack and approach these areas, particularly around divisiveness. Although a curious um, incident happened last month, and I wanted to just sound sound you out on this. There was a court case in the UK of a criminal, a terrorist in Leicester, a, a white supremacist who was. Um, was uh, tr put on trial and was told by the judge, was found guilty of ter terrorism um, and uh, being in possession of dangerous materials, but was told by the judge, if you read books by Dickens, Hardy and Jane Austen, um, you know, get me some uh, a report by January, um, you don't have to go to prison. So the first question, I know, I just, what? So the first question that springs out is, if it had been a black or brown terrorist, would they have been told to go away and read some books, right? But I want to park that for a moment because the bit that then sort of niggled onwards is, do books improve people? Also, that is not the purpose of a book, to punish someone. It's like hitting someone, but that's not its purpose. But do, do great books inspire greatness? <laughs> you know, outside of this example, I do, I do believe that books change us, books shift something in us. How do I know this? Because it happened to me. They, they did change me. They did teach me that there were other possibilities. I Was there one in particular? Is there something? No, it's the act of reading, you know, and I think it should be continuous and we can read anything and everything. I've never believed in that distinction between highbrow literature, lowbrow literature, who decides, who makes those distinctions. Let's read across the board, you know, let's read political philosophy, let's read cookbooks, let's read graphic novels, but let's make the act of reading continuous. I think w one of the biggest problems we have today is we have way too much information, but very little knowledge and even less wisdom. And we conflate these things, you know, information is not the same thing as knowledge. For knowledge, we need to slow down, we need to just go to an inner garden, we need books, we need investigative journalism, Hopefully, for wisdom, ultimately, we need to bring the mind and the heart together. One thing we have forgotten is to say, I don't know. You know, when was the last time we ever said, I don't know? We rarely say, I don't know. And usually to children, if they ask us impossible questions about the space and galaxy, we say, I don't know. But between adults, you can ask me anything. If I don't know the answer, I can Google it. And in the next five minutes, I have the illusion that I know something about the subject when I know nothing. Whereas the so process of reading a book say, is, a, is a much know. slower immersion, yeah. and yeah. so you, you take that time yeah. to enter a different... Just, just more nuanced, calmer, slower thinking is something we have forgotten. So, Rima, what did you think of that extraordinary um, legal moment? <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, it's, about, it's a moment that is about white privilege, but um, I think that if someone sat down and read all of Elif's 12 novels over the course of one year, they would not be the same person at the end of that year. And so, and that just, you know, that's the, and, and, I, and I also genuinely believe, although I think we should read across all genres, I think it's different to read a novel than to read any other kind of book because you, it is the only artistic medium in which you are um, invited to be someone else. And the, it's, there is no other way to be another person. All films are in the third person. There is no, obviously films can be incredibly moving and I, I think it's a very powerful medium, but 
you are literally allowed to be in the mind of another person if you read a novel. And I, I just believe that that has to change something about your your chemistry and your circulation and your nervous system. I, I, I really believe that. So just some carceral reform tips for free at JLF at the British <laughs> Library. Um, I want to talk about some of the responses to your work. Obviously, you have huge fan clubs, both of you, but there has been criticism, um, both, it seems, at, you know, political directions that you've taken. Um, I think, Elif, you know, sometimes it's about daring to be political. And then, Tamima, with you, it was almost, um, how, how have you written a comedy when you're from Bangladesh? How dare you be funny? You should be writing about children that live in a rubbish heap. Um, <laughs> Would you like to respond to any of that? You don't have to, but some of that sort of critical energy and, and placements where people feel that you should be. Well, I used to joke that the Bangladesh government should pay me a stipend for ambassadorial kind of duties. Do they not? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, um, because I, you know, obviously I have my different opinions about the state itself. But I felt for a long time that, it, and I still believe, that it was my responsibility to complicate people's ideas about a country that has been um, coded in a certain way um, throughout its history, throughout its 50 years of history. Um, and I thought, I felt it was my responsibility to change that, to say, oh, well, you know, it's a very poor country, but look what's happening, and look at all the, you know, money that's being poured into girls' education, and look at how the health care system has changed over the last 50 years. Um, and I think the reason I wrote this book is because I was tired of that and I wanted to do something else and I didn't want to inhabit that space, although I understand why it exists and in certain ways I feel that it's a privilege and I, and I still want to do that. Um, so I think that if we're going to talk about diversity, it's not just publishing brown voices. It's saying to people that you don't have to necessarily write about the suffering of your people and that we're interested in you beyond the suffering of your people, knowing that your people are suffering and that is something that you are deeply aware of and um, feel a responsibility towards, but we're not just interested in that. So as I said, I, I haven't really, the jury's out in myself as to whether this was the right thing to do, but it certainly came from that impulse to complicate my own sort of relationship to writing, I guess. I think it was the, definitely the right thing to do, the bright, the, the brave thing to do, and, and the outcome is, is 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 wonderful. I really hear what you're saying because I think there is this a strange type of identity politics within the publishing world, which affects non-Western authors or minority authors or immigrant authors much more acutely. So if you happen to be an Afghan women writer, for instance, nobody expects you to write avant-garde fiction or science fiction. You're expected to write about the problems of Afghan women in Afghanistan, which you might want to, but maybe the next novel is gonna be something completely different, why not? So that kind of freedom, that kind of intellectual mobility is denied if you happen to come from either a minority or a non-Western background, even if it's generations ago. And Do you feel free? It's, it's a struggle. I, I mean, nobody's completely free. Also, there are these glass walls in the publishing world that you might not see at first glance until you bump into them and then you realize they're very much there. There is sexism. I mean, where I come from, men write, usually women read. And that's something we need to change. Uh, it's, it looks very modern on the surface. We use that term a lot in Turkey, but when you scratch the surface, underneath it's the same old patriarchy. A woman writer will never be treated in the same way as a male writer, will never be reviewed in the same way. And the thing about patriarchal societies is until you are defeminized, desexualized, and deemed to be old in the eyes of the society, you will never be respected. We respect our grandmothers. Why? Because they're in a different category. They're not regarded as women anymore. So until you're an old woman writer, you won't be respected. There's a lot that you need to go through, but of course it's, it's very intersectional. I mean, being a woman of color, being uh, coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, so I'm adding all those layers upon layers in this country as well. We need to deal with all those glass walls. Absolutely, but we are among people who love books. So this is, this is the place to be. And one of the things, and I'm sure you agree with 
reading books is, well, for me anyway, I love falling in love with people in books. Um, and that's why, you know, at the British Library, you know, everybody here has a, a rich and varied love life thanks to reading books. That's why we do it. Um, and, I, you know, as I've, I've mentioned my love for Asha, I want to talk about Ada in your book, this teenage girl with the scream. I, I, that made my hair stand on end. Will you introduce her? Well, she's... Um, um, trees. <laughs> She, she's the, the child of, of a mixed, um, her, her parents come from completely different backgrounds, opposite backgrounds or tribes. Uh, her father's Greek Cypriot and her mother's Turkish Cypriot, born and bred here. Um, and what you said was so interesting, what your parents tell you, like, you know, you're, you were born in a diff completely under different circumstances, free. Uh, I find that very interesting, unlike us. So you have to behave differently. You have to build your life differently. Um, it's not easy to be young, I think, in today's world. Also, we are living in a world which never allows us to be multiple, let alone celebrate our multiplicity. I honestly believe, like Walt Whitman used to say, we all contain multitudes, but we forgot to say this, you know, let alone celebrate it. Just the opposite. The world we are living in puts us into boxes and ex expects us to stay in that box once and for all. So if you're someone like Ada or Ada, if you have all these, you know, very complex background, plus on top of that, the anxiety of being young in a world with pandemic, climate crisis, all kinds of uncertainties, there is, as I said, a scream building up inside her, which she can't express. Um, and talking of that scream building up, I want to move now, because both of your work has such a powerful feminist energy, um, and I, want to, I wish to unleash that on the planet. I want to talk about Texas. We need to talk about Texas, because everyone's pointing the finger at Afghanistan right now, but let's look at Texas and what's going on there. Um, please give me your responses. Yeah, I mean, it's, I only have a string of expletives, so I'll just keep them to myself. Yeah, I'm so, I'm, I'm so angry. How far can the world go backwards? Because you, you don't you expect perhaps entropy, things things will fall apart, but not things to go rapidly backwards. Oh, oh, sorry, no, no, it's just I felt so angry. We're just uh, raging for a second here. I think there's a myth that there is a kind of, uh, that women's bodies are freer in the West than they are not in the West. And I think that myth is, as Elif alluded to, is really fundamentally being dismantled. Um, you know, abortion has always been legal in Bangladesh. There is no conversation about birth control. It's called, actually, it's like a state-approved, you know, it's called population control, wh wh that, which, which is controversial in and of itself, because that can also be very kind of, you know, controlling women's bodies. But we imagine that these ideas of feminism, which are about women having sovereignty over their own bodies, was somehow born in Western feminism, and that somehow that is where they flourish. And, and we know now that is fundamentally not true. So although what happened in Texas is enraging, it's just an example of how we have a completely distorted idea of where feminism lives and where it needs to live and who needs to be a feminist. Everyone needs to be a feminist. You know, generations of women in the West growing up feeling like, oh, I don't need to be a feminist. I have all the rights. I can get whatever job. I can get into college, etc. So, yeah, it's as you said. We're, we, want, we should be talking about Texas, not Afghanistan, or we should ta be talking about both. Elif. Yeah, I mean, it feels to me like we're constantly being told to be thankful for being born here or there in the sense that uh, many women in the Western world think, had I been born over there, I would have no rights. And then many women, for instance, across the Middle East, they think, well, had I been born over there, I would be a sexual object, I wouldn't have family ties. And they're myths. We constantly produce myths about each other. This the cliche, the duality of East versus West. We need to go beyond that dualistic, you know, binary oppositions and realize that patriarchy is universal, feminism is needed everywhere. The kind of women's movement that I long for goes hand in hand also with LGBTQ plus rights, but also brings men on board. Because one thing that I've observed in places like Turkey, of course it's not easy to be a woman, 
But it's not easy to be a man either, especially if you're a young man who doesn't conform to the given descriptions of masculinity. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be shunned. You're going to be ostracized. And sometimes women can take part in that conversation as well. So we need to dismantle patriarchy together rather than thinking in binary oppositions. What's happening in Texas, if I may add this very quickly, is, is so horrific. It's not only the most extreme abortion ban, including cases of rape, including cases of incest, incest sorry. Um, but it's also the kind of abortion ban that asks the civil society to keep an eye on women's bodies. So if you're an Uber driver, and if you happen to pick up a woman who wants to have an abortion, you will also be punished under that law. You know, that kind of per, you know, pervading into this every layer of daily life, it's something else. And I find it very, very problematic and creepy. Any questions from the audience? Yes, have we, have we got microphones in action? Uh, there's somebody here by the edge of the stairs. Thank you. Have to hold it. Sorry? Oh. Um, I just wanted to ask a rather outrageous question. If all books, let's say for one year, all books that were put forward for a prize had no um, information about the writer, whether they were male, female, whoever, do you think it would make a difference to the judges about what they chose as the, you know, the top or the, the best of all those books? Oh, I love this question. It recalls Kamala Shamsi's argument for a year of reading women. Can you respond to this one, Elif, and then you to me? Tough, tough question. <laughs> great question. Uh, I think, really, it's a great question. And, of course, we all have our own personal biases that we, we're not very much aware of, and it's life is about learning. This is why we need to have these conversations and cultural spaces not only with regards to names or the age or the gender of the author, I think also the techniques uh, of storytelling. We are used to a certain way of storytelling and we think that's the right way to write a novel. But for instance, where I come from, there's also a very vivid oral storytelling, which is a bit more circular, cyclical, a bit more repetitive, actually. But it's not exactly repetitive, because each, with each turn, you open up another layer, another layer. And I really love that kind of storytelling. So to, if we read across the world, especially more translation, and then you read authors from China, you know, from different parts of, of the world, you realize there are all these kinds of, there's a diversity of uh, ways of storytelling. Sometimes we lose sight of that as well as judges. I know many judges, you know, I've also judged prizes, Tahmima also, that we do our best to overcome our own biases as well, but there's a level of subjectivity that we should always be aware of. Yeah, I totally agree. I judged a prize that was in its 19th year and had never been given to a woman. And it was a prize for travel writing. And I think we associate travelers to be male and, and travel writing to be, to be a male kind of genre. Um, and when I was judging that prize, I said to everyone, I said, we have to give this prize for women this year. I mean, I know it's a bit controversial because obviously I read all the books, but it had gone on for 19 years. And there is, I just do not believe that there was not a worthy female winner of that prize for 19 years. Um, so, you know, sometimes you just have to. I would like to say that the winner of this year's Stanford Dolman Travel Prize was Taran Khan, who was also featuring in the Jaipur Lit Fest, and I was on the judging panel of that, so yeah, more women winning prizes. But is that what you meant? Did you mean to address gender imbalance or just greater representation of minority authors, kind of sneakily, or? <laughs> authors on sure. then you know so they could just make up their mind is this a good book or isn't it mm -hmm. you know am I enjoying it do I like the characters in the book that would be a wonderful thing to see there was a question here a little bit further down and there's also a question here if we have uh, more microphones in action please some some yeah some some you've, have you changed your mind yes you <laughs> and uh, and then next microphone to this person I'm going to come around we need one of those long microphone things. You need a selfie stick. Bear with us, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, it's really going back to 
a previous question be that you asked uh, Alif, but somehow broader. Both uh, Tamima and Elif are what we, I hope you excuse me if you describe you as multicultural, okay? Because of your background, because of where you were born and the societies that you lived in. And that sort of instills in you a different sense of, a sense of identity, okay? If you lived in France, brought in France, you know, up to the age of that's 10, you acquire a different identity, the Frenchness, than um, the period that you lived in Turkey, for instance, because that will actually give you a different uh, 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 identity characteristics. But in your writings, do you find yourself trying to perhaps suppress that identity or subconsciousness in the way that you are trying to represent a particular uh, character in, uh, in your novels. Therefore, is there, you feel yourself that you, I've got to suppress that Frenchness in me. I've got either to suppress the Turkishness in me or Englishness in me and so forth. Thank you. I'm going to ask you this both in, both in turn. Is there any part of yourself and your identity that you suppress in order to, to write? Thank you. Um, I think it's a great question, and I think um, when you are trying to inhabit the life of another person, you have to choose um, which parts of yourself you're going to put in that person. Now, on the one hand, you can never really suppress anything in yourself. You can only really be in your own mind, so that's just the problem of subjectivity. But I think, as I imagine, uh, when we write characters, we just have to take certain bits of ourselves and put them in those people and take other parts out. And that's not necessarily a political choice or a choice about which parts of my identity I want to suppress, but purely being an instrument in the service of that book or that character in that moment. I, I also think it's a, it's a beautiful question. And it makes me think uh, harder. But I think for me, literature is the opposite of suppression. It's where I feel free where I can be multiple. Um, just, you know, a personal note, I was very little when I, when I left France, so I didn't go to school or anything in, in, in France. I can't even speak the language. But regardless of all of that, if I hear your question correctly, I, I think the issue is the identity or belongings. They are so plural. It's not static. It's not monolithic. We think they are so. So anyone who is familiar with my fiction can realize that I am very attached to Istanbul. It doesn't matter whether I am there right now or not. We don't abandon the places we love just because we're miles away or continents away. They come with us. Sometimes, you know, homelands are portable. The, the motherlands are portable. When I look at myself, of course I'm an Istanbulite. Of course I'm very attached to Turkishness, whatever that means, you know, the culture, women's culture. But also I think I'm attached to the Balkans. I have elements in my soul from the Middle East. I would like to think I'm European, you know, the values that I share. I did become a Londoner over the years. I did become a British citizen over the years. And despite what politicians have been telling us in this country because of this Brexit saga, I want to call myself a citizen of the world, a citizen of humanity. That doesn't mean you have no sense of attachment or you don't really feel anyone's pain. It's just the opposite. You do have multiple attachments. But I want to take a step further. And I want to say this is not only a privilege that people who travel or come from multicultural backgrounds enjoy. All human beings have multiple multiplicity. Maybe you were born and raised and you got married in the same town. Whether it's your sexual identity, whether it's the stories of your ancestors, how can I know every human being is so complex, layer upon layer, or, and you know? But that's the thing we're not allowed to bring out, and that's why we need literature, because in a novel you can be multiple and you can celebrate that multiplicity. I think that deserves some applause. <laughs> You've just brought to mind a quote that I, I had ready plucked from 40 Rules of Love. Uh, Rumi's wife, Kara, says, and I think this speaks very much to what you've, you've just asked, ours is an ever-liquid world where everything flows and mixes. If there is a frontier between Christianity and Islam, it has to be more flexible than scholars on both sides think it is. 
Um, can, we go, can we get through to the next questions, please? And forgive me for checking online. I just want to see if anyone's got uh, a message. Um, thank you. It's moved on a little bit. First of all, it was just a comment, the, the lady's lovely question about, pan, about uh, uh, knowing the identity of uh, writers for prizes. Um, I happen to be a panelist, a jury member for a, for a music prize a few years ago, a composition prize with the um, British, so British uh, Association of... Um, of Basker, the song, songwriters and composers, and there for the first time, actually, the, it, the entrants were, uh, all the names were taken off, so we listened to music uh, and we didn't know the composers, and this was to, a, a composer prize. And I have to say, as a jury member, I found that hugely liberating. It was absolutely wonderful not to know. It was also quite scary because, of course, uh, you know, one might have uh, recognised or thought one recognised the music of certain, certain uh, composers, and it was quite interesting then being proved quietly right or wrong. Um, but it was a wonderfully liberating thing uh, and uh, it produced some really interesting results. I just wanted to say that. Um, I love the things that, we, that uh, have been talked about. I love the idea of trusting questions, perhaps more, than, an question? more than answers. I have one question. Okay. Um, during the, the, the pandemic, just talking about listening, um, I certainly found myself looking and listening more deeply, I think, during this time. That's one of the things that's come out of it. And I just wondered whether that is something that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, any of you have felt as well. Actually, that's a good point. We haven't talked much about the experience of lockdown, whether it made us listen or not. Do you ha what, what, how can you respond to that? I spent a lot more time with my children. <laughs> and I heard everything from, you know, profound things coming out of my four-year-old's mouth to, like, very high-pitched screaming. Um, more that than was I you, presumably. That, <laughs> in, only in, on the inside, really. Um, but no, Ellie, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, but we, we all s spent more time with our families, uh, but also inside. Uh, and I think that's very, very precious. But I remember at the very beginning of the pandemic, some publishers with good intentions, they tweeted things like saying, it's not going to be a huge difference for authors because authors are used to working from home. They don't do office work. They don't do teamwork. They're solitary creatures anyhow, so lockdown won't affect them that much. My experience is the exact opposite. I think it, it did affect us very much. We are not immune. We are not disconnected from the world, just the opposite. And when so much is happening, when people are dying in their thousands, you question yourself, you know, is this what I should be writing right now? Does it really matter if I find the perfect synonym, if I find, you know, the move that comma from this sentence to the next, suddenly it loses its meaning and you have to sit down and, and go through some existential questions like all of us. I think it's a time when we need to reorder our values and priorities. What do we want in life to earn more money? you know, more haste, profit, corporate greed? Or is it those immaterial things in life that really matter? Like friendship, like family, like sisterhood, like sitting under a tree, you know, reading a book. Those are the valuable ones. So it's, it's a moment of reckoning, I think, both individually and collectively, and writers are not immune to that. That's definitely a thought to, to hang on to. And um, we've got time for one more, and it's yours. No pressure. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to say I've been living in here for 18 years. I'm a Turkish woman, and one of the reasons I came here was actually very much in line with Elif's. You are my favorite author, and you were talking about like you know, a, you know, a book whether it can you know change the, for somebody else's life or not. But 40 Rules of Love changed my entire life. Because of 40 Rules of Love, I started to like research more about Sufism. My grandfather was a Sufi. He was the member of um, Nakshi Bandi Tariqa. I was looking at what he was doing was like, you know, a complete um, madness. But I found a lot about Sufism. And now I'm actually studying transpersonal psychotherapy. And, um, and which is, you know, have a lot of ties with the Sufism. And 40 Rules of uh, you know, 40 Rules of Love, actually, uh, same from depression twice. And I started to buy the book to a lot of my friends as a present. I don't know how many books that I bought so far. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, and I brought my friend today. She's American and writer. And I said to her, she has to know you. She has to get to know you. And she asked me which book I should start from. And I was like, right, 40 Rules of Love, of course. <laughs> 
But I would like to ask this question to you. What do you think, you know, if someone is going to, you know, read your first time, which book they should start with? And unfortunately, I never read uh, Tamima. I feel so awful right now. I know, there's a bookshop right outside. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was going to actually buy, uh, but which one you would recommend? Like, if you believe that this book is going to change somebody else's life, which book they should start with? Uh I'm really enjoying this super fangirl moment. I really am. It's really amazing. So thank you. It's it's very difficult for us to to choose one book, you know, among our our, our books because I think if we have to choose, we will always choose the book we are yet to write, not <laughs> any of. The, but I really appreciate your words. I really, that really means a lot to me. And that's the beauty of it, isn't it? Because when you write, you really don't know if that book is going to mean anything to anyone other than you. And you have to have that kind of faith and keep writing. And when you meet people from different parts of the world and they say, I read your book and it really meant something to me, that's, that's incredibly precious. I, 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 I thank you very much. Thank you for that, because that was a question that answered some of the earlier questions about the power of books, you know, and it's brought us full circle. I'm going to be the one to tell everybody what to buy. This book and this book. Well, actually, many of your books, um, we've got the wonderful Viv of New and Books, which is one of our favourite bookstores. They're all available outside. I'm going to end with a quote from Bertrand Russell, who said, there are two reasons to read a book. One is to enjoy it. The other is to boast about it. With these books, you can do both. <laughs> Please join me in thanking my wonderful guests. Come, come, have a seat. Oh, look. To Arya, Rajasthan seemed a bit like this. Wow, we'll all fit. All of us. Money, money, baby.